Welcome to this supplemental presentation for session two of DLS 105 Risk Tools and Calculations for Risk Assessments. In this presentation, you will be provided with a demonstration of how to perform quantitative risk calculations for a concrete spillway subjected to seismic hazard. The objective of the presentation is to provide you with an example quantitative risk calculation that you can reference and replicate during a dam risk analysis. We'll start with a brief introduction to seismic structural risk calculations and an overview of our example project. We'll then walk through the risk calculation process step by step, beginning with putting together a joint loading probability matrix, interpolating system response probabilities, and performing risk calculations for several potential failure modes and the project total by deriving failure equations from event tree analysis. First, a brief introduction to seismic structural risk calculations and our example project. The method for performing structural calculations for concrete spillway failure subjected to seismic hazard is different from the evaluation of typical hydrologic potential failure modes because the failure of structural components such as gates, piers, or anchorages can be combined and can result in several different breach sizes, typically given by a number of spillway gates or monoliths. This can become complicated because the failure of a given component can result in several different breach scenarios. For example, a gate failure for a four-gate concrete spillway could result in a one-gate breach, a two-gate breach, a three-gate breach, or a four-gate breach depending on the failure combination. Therefore, the method for calculating the annual probability of failure and average annual life loss for a concrete spillway structure includes the use of combinatorics to develop equations for a discrete breach size that include the probability of failure or non-failure of multiple concrete spillway components. The remainder of the presentation will walk through example risk calculations for a hypothetical project. A spreadsheet containing the example project is available for download and you can use it to follow along and perform the calculations yourself. The project that we'll evaluate for this example is a gated concrete spillway with two tainter or radial gates. Each gate has a corresponding end anchorage and the spillway contains one reinforced concrete pier between the gates. During a seismic event, the spillway can fail due to a failure of the pier, PFM1, failure of one or both spillway gates, PFM2, or failure of one or both end anchorages, PFM3. Failure of the reinforced concrete pier always results in a breach of both spillway gates, while the failure of a single tainer gate or single end anchorage results in a breach of one spillway gate. Our task for the example is to calculate the marginal PFM risk for PFM1, PFM2, and PFM3, as well as the total risk for the spillway. The first step in the risk calculation process for seismic potential failure modes is to complete a joint loading probability matrix. When evaluating seismic potential failure modes, two conditions must be present. There must be a seismic event and the structure must be hydraulically loaded. If a seismic event occurs, but the water level is too low to result in uncontrolled release, then there aren't any consequences. If the water is high, but there's no seismic event, then there won't be a failure. These conditions are accounted for by the seismic hazard curve and the stage duration curve. The seismic hazard curve is annualized, while the stage duration curve is not. So our seismic hazard curve is similar to our stage frequency curve. And then the stage duration curve provides the percent of time that the reservoir is at or above a given stage at any time. So this way we avoid annualizing both hazard variables, which would lead to erroneous results. To evaluate the potential failure modes, we need to discretize the hazard variables, just like we do for hydrologic PFMs. But since we have two hazard variables, we use a joint loading probability matrix with the reservoir stages discretized on the y-axis and the seismic hazard discretized on the x-axis. This allows us to calculate the probability that a seismic event occurs while a given peak stage is present behind the spillway. For the reservoir stages, our directions say to discretize into five even intervals using a minimum stage of 623.16 or the gated spillway crest 
and a maximum stage of 644.65, or top of active storage. Since reservoir levels below 623.16 will not load the spillway gates, uncontrolled release in the event of a failure will not occur, so therefore non-exceedance will not be added to the first partition. To linearly discretize into even intervals, we're going to use the equation that's on the slide. N is set equal to 5 and is the number of intervals. The bottom of the first interval is set equal to the minimum stage being evaluated, or elevation 623.16, while the top of the final partition is set equal to the maximum stage being evaluated, or elevation 644.65. To calculate the upper stage of the first interval, we take the difference between our greatest peak stage of 644.65 and our lowest peak stage of 623.16 and divide that number by n minus 1 which for an n of 5 equals 4. We add that value to the bottom elevation of the first partition in cell E13. We'll use the dollar signs in Excel to lock the row and column of the cells in the numerator because they're constants and will stay the same for subsequent intervals. The bottom of the next interval picks up right where the first interval left off, so we set cell E14 equal to the elevation that we just calculated in cell F13. From there, we can drag the formulas down in columns E and F to complete those columns of the table. Now that we've discretized the full range of loading in the five intervals, let's calculate the loading probability in each of them. We're going to interpolate using the Excel interpolation macro discussed in the session two presentation. Stage duration is plotted on a linear scale, so we will use linear interpolation. Since we're not including non-exceedance, we use linear interpolation to calculate the exceedance probability for stage one, interpolate again to calculate the exceedance probability for stage two, and then subtract it from the stage one probability. Remember to use the dollar signs for the peak stage array and the exceedance probability array, and then you can drag that formula down to complete all but the last cell of the table. The final interval is our exceedance probability, which in this case is the probability of having a stage greater than elevation 644.65. You can interpolate like I've done here, or the easiest thing would be just to set the probability equal to the exceedance probability for elevation 644.65 directly from the table, which is an exceedance probability of 5.7 e to the minus 5. So that completes the stage partitions in the joint loading probability matrix. As a check, let's sum the loading probabilities for our stages. Remember that our stage partitions don't include the non-exceedance probability for stages less than the spillway crest elevation of 623.16. Since a breach of the spillway gates with a reservoir stage less than the spillway crest will not result in an uncontrolled release of the reservoir in incremental consequences, including non-exceedance probability for stages less than spillway crest would artificially inflate the incremental risk. So in this case, the probabilities in the table should be equal to the exceedance probability of the minimum stage included in the table, which in this case is elevation 623.16. We can see that the sum of our probabilities is equal to the exceedance probability of this stage, so we're in good shape. Next, we follow the same procedure to discretize the seismic hazard by peak ground acceleration. Our instructions are to discretize the seismic hazard into five even intervals using a PGA threshold of 0.05 G and a maximum PGA value of 0.6 G. Again, we're not going to be including non-exceedance. The top of our first partition is calculated using the equation on the slide, which is the same equation that we use to discretize the reservoir stages.
The seismic hazard curve is plotted on a semi-logarithmic scale, so we'll use linear interpolation for PGA and logarithmic interpolation for annual exceedance probability. The procedure for calculating the probability of the first partition is identical to what we did for the stage partitions since we're not including non-exceedance. And just as with the stage partitions, the final interval is the exceedance probability, which is the probability of having a PGA greater than 0.6G. You can use interpolation, or you can set the probability equal to the annual exceedance probability for a PGA of 0.6G from the table, which is 1 times 10 to the minus 4. Just like we did with our stage probabilities, let's do a quick check by summing the loading probabilities for the seismic hazard. And again, since we don't have non-exceedance, the sum of the probabilities should be equal to the AEP of the lowest peak ground acceleration in the table, 0.05G, which it is. So we're good to go. Now that we have the probabilities associated with our stage and PGA partitions, we fill in the remainder of the joint loading probability matrix by multiplying the terms together. This will give us the probability of having a peak stage within a given interval, while simultaneously having a seismic event with a PGA within a given interval. For the first stage partition between stage 623.16 and 628.53, and the first PGA partition between 0.05G and 0.19G, we simply multiply their interval probabilities together to get their joint probability. We use dollar signs to lock the row for PGA probabilities and column for stage probabilities so we can drag the formula down and over. And then we have our completed joint loading probability matrix. As one final check, we can sum the probabilities within the joint loading probability matrix to see if we've captured everything correctly. The sum of the probabilities within the matrix should be equal to the product of the sums of the loading probabilities for the stages and seismic hazard. So first, sum the loading probabilities for the peak stage intervals and PGA intervals and multiply them together. Next, sum the probabilities within the joint loading probability matrix and compare the sum to the product. For our table, we find that the probabilities are equal to each other which lets us know that we didn't make any mistakes with the discretization, interpolation, or multiplication. Now that the joint loading probability matrix is complete, we turn to our system response probabilities. System response probabilities have been previously elicited for PFM1, PFM2, and PFM3 for a range of peak stage and peak ground acceleration as shown in the tables on the left of the slide. Next, we take the elicited system response probabilities and use them to populate system response probability tables within the joint loading probability matrix via two-way interpolation. This intermediate step will make it easier to calculate the annual probability of failure for each PFM and the total project risk later. We'll use semi-logarithmic interpolation to calculate the system response probability for given peak stage and PGA intervals, with linear interpolation being used for peak stage and PGA and logarithmic interpolation being used for the system response probability using by lin lin log int. For the first cell on the table, we interpolate based on the midpoint of the peak stage interval and the midpoint of the PGA interval. Use dollar signs to lock the cells to allow the formula to be dragged down and to the right. Doing this, we get a system response probability for PFM1 for the first joint interval of 9.07 e to the minus 6. Now we drag that formula down and to the right to complete the system response table for PFM1 and then repeat the same process for PFM2. Once PFM2 is complete, we go through the process one more time to calculate PFM3. And what we end up with are final system response probability tables within the joint loading probability matrix for all of our potential failure modes.
Now, before we jump into our PFM evaluations, I want to take a few slides to introduce the concepts that we'll be using to perform the risk calculations, as they're a little different than the ones that we use to calculate risk for hydrologic PFMs. For the spillway that we're evaluating, there are three possible breach scenarios, a breach of gate one only, a breach of gate two only, and a breach of both gates simultaneously. These breaches are mutually exclusive. A failure of gate one only cannot occur at the same time as a failure of gate two only, which cannot occur at the same time as a failure of both gates. Therefore, we can calculate the annual probability of failure for each breach scenario, and then sum them to obtain the total probability of failure. So the total annual probability of failure is equal to the APF of a gate one only failure, plus the APF of a gate two only failure, plus the APF of a failure of both gates. To calculate the average annual life loss, we do the same thing, but we add consequences for each breach scenario. For our example, the consequences of a gate one only breach are the same as the consequences as a gate two only breach. Therefore, we can simplify the APF and average annual life loss equations by accounting for a gate one only failure and a gate two only failure within one term for a one gate breach. The total APF equation is then equal to the APF for a one gate breach plus the APF for a two gate breach. We'll be calculating the marginal risk for each potential failure mode and the total project risk. The marginal PFM risk captures the probability of failure only from the specific component that's being evaluated. For this example, we have three PFMs. PFM1 is peer failure, PFM2 is gate failure, and PFM3 is end anchorage failure. When calculating the total risk, we'll need to capture the probability of failure due to all of the components. We'll be using an event tree model to facilitate the risk calculations and to ensure that there are no failure scenarios that we're missing. This model provides an intuitive graphical depiction of the failure or non-failure of each component and how those failures and non-failures combine to form different breach combinations. At the front of the tree are the loading variables for the joint loading probability. Each subsequent level in the tree represents failure or non-failure of a specific component, the pier, gate, or end anchorage. For the PFM marginal risk calculations, only one component will be present. For the total project risk calculations, all components will be included. These levels are collectively exhaustive, so they contain all possible failure combinations. For the gates, there are four combinations, a failure of neither gate one nor gate two, a failure of gate one alongside a non-failure of gate two, a failure of gate two alongside a non-failure of gate one, and a failure of gates one and two. Next to the event tree end nodes, the breach size that results from that specific failure combination is shown. Listing the breach sizes is helpful when calculating the annual probability of failure as it helps to determine which equations should be summed for each breach size. Finally, the failure or non-failure equations are displayed to show how the probability for each branch is calculated. Now that we have a handle on the process, let's get into the evaluation of PFM1 peer failure. The event tree for failure of the pier is shown at the top of the slide. There's only one pier at the project, so there are only two failure combinations. The pier fails or it doesn't. If it fails, it always results in a two gate breach. Out to the right of the event tree, we see the failure equations that we'll use in the risk calculations. For ease, the joint loading probability matrix and the system response probability table within the joint loading probability matrix for the pier have been copied onto the sheet. Incremental life loss for one gate and two gate breach scenarios for both day and night are provided, and we're told to assume a 10 hour workday for exposure. First, we'll calculate the annual probability of failure for a one gate breach. 
For the peer, this is easy. There is no possible failure combination for the peer that results in a one gate breach. So therefore, the system response probability for the peer resulting in a one gate breach is zero. So in the top left corner of the table, we multiply the joint loading probability for those partitions by zero. The final APF table for a one gate breach is pretty boring. Zeros across the board. Now we have an annual probability table that's partitioned on both peak stage and peak ground acceleration. However, our incremental life loss is only a function of peak stage. In order to calculate the average annual life loss, we need to calculate the total APF for each of the peak stage partitions and then interpolate an incremental life loss value to multiply together. To calculate the total APF for the peak stage partitions, we simply sum the annual probability of failure for the entire row across all of the peak ground acceleration partitions. We then drag that formula down to complete the APF column. Next, we follow the instructions to calculate exposure. Assuming a 10 hour workday, we calculate day exposure as 10 hours divided by 24 hours in a day. We then calculate night exposure by subtracting the day exposure value from one to ensure that the exposure is collectively exhaustive. We can then drag those formulas down to complete the exposure columns. Next, we interpolate our day incremental life loss by using the midpoint of each partition and linear interpolation. Remember here to make sure that you're referencing the life loss for the correct breach size. Next, do the same thing for the night life loss. And then drag those formulas down to complete the life loss columns. Finally, calculate the average annual life loss for each partition by multiplying the APF for a given interval by the weighted life loss. Drag down the formula to complete the average annual life loss column. Since the APF for a one gate breach is zero, the average annual life loss is also zero. Now we move on to calculating the APF for a two gate breach. For the peer, the failure equation is the joint loading probability multiplied by the straight system response probability for peer failure. When we drag that formula down and to the right to complete the table. The process to complete the APF, life loss, and average annual life loss calculations for the two gate breach is the same as the one gate breach. First, sum the APF across the rows to get the annual probability of failure for each stage partition. Drag that formula down to complete the APF column. Compute the day exposure by dividing 10 by 24. And then calculate the night exposure as 1 minus the day exposure and drag those formulas down. Use linear interpolation to calculate the incremental life loss for both day and night, making sure to reference the two gate breach incremental life loss table up above. And then we do the same thing for our night life loss. Finally, calculate the average annual life loss by multiplying the APF against the weighted incremental life loss for each partition. And then the last step is to drag down the average annual life loss column to complete the table. Now that we've completed the APF and average annual life loss tables for a one gate breach and a two gate breach, we can combine them together to calculate the marginal risk for PFM1. We start by summing the annual probability of failure column for the one gate breach. Since the probability of a one gate breach for the peer is zero, this sum will be equal to zero. Next, we do the same thing for the average annual life loss column. To calculate the average life loss value for a one gate breach, 
we divide the one gate average annual life loss by the one gate annual probability of failure. Since both of those terms are zero, we'll get an error for this calculation within Excel. We follow the same process to calculate the marginal risk for a two gate breach. First, sum the APF. Next, sum the average annual life loss. Then divide average annual life loss by annual probability of failure to get the average life loss for the two gate breach. Since the one gate breach and two gate breach scenarios are mutually exclusive, we simply sum them together to calculate the total marginal risk for the PFM. First, sum the one gate and two gate APF to get the total APF. Next, do the same for average annual life loss. Finally, divide the total average annual life loss by the total annual probability of failure to calculate the total average life loss. And with that, we've calculated the marginal risk for PFM1. This estimate will be the one that's plotted on the FN chart when we portray the total risk estimate. Now we'll move on to our second PFM, gate failure. Many of the calculations for this PFM are identical to the ones we just showed for PFM1. However, there's an important difference at the front end of the calculations that we cannot miss. This slide shows the event tree for gate failure. While there was only one peer to consider in PFM1, PFM2 has to consider both spillway gates in the failure combinations. There are four combinations for this PFM. Gates one and two both do not fail. Gate one fails while gate two does not fail. Gate two fails while gate one does not fail. And gates one and two both fail. The first combination does not result in any breach. The second and third combinations result in a one gate breach. And the fourth combination results in a two gate breach. The failure equations for each of the scenarios are shown out to the right. Pay close attention to the fact that the probability of failure or non-failure of both gates must be accounted for in the risk calculations. The joint loading probability matrix, the system response probability table within the joint loading probability matrix, and incremental life loss tables have again been included for ease. Just as with the peer failure, the first thing we do is calculate the annual probability of failure for a one gate breach. To calculate the probability of a one gate breach, we have to sum all of the combinations from the event tree that result in a one gate breach. In this case, there are two combinations, gate one fails while gate two does not, and gate two fails while gate one does not. Each scenario is represented by multiplying the probability of gate failure by one minus the probability of gate failure, with the two equations being added together. Once summed, the two combinations are multiplied by the joint loading probability for each partition. That formula is then dragged down and to the right to complete the table. Next, we calculate the APF, exposure, life loss, and average annual life loss for each stage interval for a one gate breach. This process is identical to PFM1, so I'm not going to repeat each step, but you can view the completed table on the slide. Now we move on to calculating the annual probability of failure for the two gate breach. There's only one failure combination that results in a two gate breach for the gates, a failure of gate one and gate two at the same time. To calculate the probability of failure, we multiply the joint loading probability times the probability of failure of gate one and the probability of failure of gate two. That formula is dragged down and to the right to complete the table, and then the APF, exposure, life loss, and average annual life loss for each stage partition are calculated using the same procedure as before. Our last step is to calculate the marginal risk for the one gate breach scenario, 
two gate breach scenario and total PFM2 risk, just as we did for PFM1. Now we move on to our third and final PFM, PFM3 for end anchorage failure. The calculations for PFM3 are straightforward as they're exactly the same as the calculations for PFM2. There are two end anchorages and four failure scenarios, with two of the scenarios resulting in a one gate breach and one scenario resulting in a two gate breach. For expediency, I'm only gonna show the completed tables for this PFM for your reference. Here are the tables for PFM3 for a one gate breach, a two gate breach, and the marginal PFM risk. At this point, we've calculated the marginal risk for all three of our PFMs. Now we need to combine all the PFMs to calculate the total project risk. In order to correctly calculate the total risk, we need to use the joint risk model to capture all the discrete failure combinations, just as we did for the individual PFMs. While this process was relatively simple and straightforward for calculating marginal PFM risk, it gets more complicated when combining and calculating the total. We'll use the same event tree model to derive the total risk equations as we used for the marginal PFM risk calculations, but the total risk event tree contains every spillway component, the pier, the gates, and the end anchorage. The event tree for the total risk failure scenarios is shown on the left of the slide. Here's a larger image of the top half of the event tree. The first node in the tree is for the pier and contains two scenarios, pier non-failure and pier failure. Next is the gate with four scenarios, followed by the end anchorage, also with four scenarios. What we end up with is 31 different failure combinations and one non-failure combination for a total of 32 distinct ways that failure or non-failure can occur. The next step is one that isn't easily shown and isn't easy to accomplish. Using the event tree, failure equations for each breach size must be combined into total failure equations for a one gate breach and a two gate breach by summing them together. This is the same process that we went through for the marginal PFM calculations, but the total risk equations are functions of the failure or non-failure of the pier, gates, and end anchorages, which makes them more complicated. This is a tedious process and it can be easy to make mistakes if you're not careful. I'm not going to show the, the failure equations on the slide, but we'll get a glimpse of them when we calculate the total project risk in the next section. The equations that we'll be using have been simplified for the sake of calculations, but if you have more questions about how they were derived, you can reach out and we'll provide more information. At this point in the process, we've gone through the hard work of deriving the failure equations from the event tree, so now we can move on to calculating the total project risk. For the total risk calculations, we will need the joint loading probability matrix and the system response probability tables within the joint loading probability matrix for all three of our PFMs. All those tables have been copied onto one sheet for ease, and from there, the process of calculating the total APF is the same as it was for the marginal PFM calculations, except we use the one gate breach and two gate breach failure equations from the total risk event tree. To calculate the one gate breach APF, plug in the one gate breach equation into the table. Notice that the equation is referencing the system response probabilities of each component to calculate the total. Once the first value has been calculated, drag the formula down and to the right to complete the table. From here, follow the same procedure that we used previously for the marginal PFM calculations to get the total APF, life loss, and average annual life loss for the one gate breach. First, sum the APF across the rows. Next, compute the day exposure, and then calculate the night exposure. We use linear interpolation in the midpoint of the stage partition to calculate day life loss. Again, remember to reference the one gate breach life loss for the one gate breach table. 
Following the daytime life loss, we use the same linear interpolation formula to calculate the night life loss. And then multiply the annual probability of failure by the weighted life loss to calculate average annual life loss. And just like that, we have a complete one gate breach total risk table. Next, we repeat the process for the two gate breach. So first, we use the two gate breach equation to calculate the annual probability of failure. Notice that the two gate breach equation is much more complicated than the one gate breach equation because there are many more failure scenarios that lead to a two gate breach over a one gate breach. Be sure to exercise caution when plugging these formulas into Excel because it can be easy to make a mistake. Drag the formula down into the right to complete the two gate breach APF table. Following the same procedure as before, fill out the APF, life loss, and average annual life loss table, making sure to reference the two gate breach life loss values with your life loss interpolation formulas. And then from there, we perform the same calculations to fill out the total risk table as we did for the marginal PFM risk calculations. First, sum the APF column for the one gate breach to calculate the total one gate breach annual probability of failure. Then we do the same thing for the average annual life loss. And finally, we calculate the average life loss for a one gate breach by dividing the average annual life loss by the annual probability of failure. And then we do the same thing for the two gate breach. First, we sum the total annual probability of failure. Then we sum the total average annual life loss. And then we calculate the average life loss. And since the one gate breach and two gate breach scenarios are mutually exclusive, we calculate the total APF by summing the APF of the one gate breach and the APF of the two gate breach. We do the same thing to calculate the total average annual life loss. And finally, we get our total average life loss by dividing the total average annual life loss by the total annual probability of failure. And there we have it. So that is the total risk for the concrete spillway due to a seismic hazard. We now plot the marginal PFM risk points and the total risk point on the little fn chart, just as we would for any other project. The marginal PFM points represent the mutually exclusive risk from each potential failure mode, while the total risk point represents the combination of all potential failure modes. For our project, we can see that PFMs 1 and 2, the pier and the gates respectively, and the total risk plot between 0 and 1 half order of magnitude above the average annual life loss guideline, while PFM 3 plots about a half order of magnitude below the guideline. So that concludes this example presentation. I hope that it was a helpful illustration of the steps that are required to calculate risk for these types of structures.